This Studio Sacramento episode is supported by UC Davis Health, where doctors, nurses, and researchers share a passion for advancing health. Learn more about their latest medical innovations at health.ucdavis.edu. The UC Davis School of Medicine offers a free mini medical school to hundreds of local residents each year. Participants learn about issues ranging from addiction to healthy aging. Dean Allison Brashear joins us to talk about the program, the medical school, and its impact on the Sacramento region. Dean Brashear, what exactly is a mini medical school program? Well, thank you so much, Scott. Mini medical school is a program where we bring the School of Medicine to the community. It's typically been in person and it's been going on for 19 years. This year, we went from having 750 people be able to participate to over almost 1,600. We have room for actually up to 3,000 people. Wow. You know, uh, for it to go on that many years, and so many of us haven't heard anything about it, um, I certainly need to get out more. What was the inspiration for UC Davis to start this program in the first place? Well, um, we certainly are thrilled to be able to tell you more about it. We really wanted to bring the medical school to the community. So there's so many great things that go on in our medical school. As you know, we have state-of-the-art researchers, uh, we have educators, and we really can bring this, these topics to the community. So a great example is everything about COVID. So we had uh, Dr. Stu Cohen, uh, who actually is featured this week in the New England Journal in one of his clinical trials that we participated in. And he spoke to the group about COVID. There was another uh, uh, presentation about isolation in COVID. So it's really a great way to bring uh, the cutting edge science to the community. And um, now with uh, doing it virtually, we can open it up to so many more people. Tell us a little bit about uh, Dr. Cohen and the journal article that uh, was just published. So what we've been doing here at UC Davis is a large number of clinical trials. And this is a clinical trial that was published that we were a participant here about to the combination of two drugs uh, in COVID patients. Um, one of the things that I really am so proud of is, as you know, uh, we had the first community acquired case in the country at UC Davis on February 26th. On March 2nd, we rallied about 40 people from all over campus, the clinics, pathology, all the regulatory people. We're in a conference room uh, right behind me and on the phone, and we figured out what we needed to do. And we were able to rapidly get research trials up and running, some within five days. So we were able to bring clinical trials, research to patients, in the early days of COVID, these were the only medications that we could give patients with COVID. So early on, if you came to UC Davis, you received remdesivir as part of the research trial. We morphed into the vaccine trials and we're, uh, we're a large enroller in the Pfizer trial. I'm so proud that UC Davis enrolled one of the most diverse groups in the Pfizer vaccine trial across the country. And now we've recently had many other trials that we've enrolled, uh, including another recent trial that Dr. Cohen did. Interesting. Uh, talking about the pandemic, I, I'm curious, how has the pandemic affected the mini medical school program and what have you learned? So the mini medical school has grown exponentially since we've been able to go virtually. So we usually had 750 people. Now we have upwards of 2000 people attending you know, I think this really means that people get more data, they get more science, and they're actually seeing um, what we have here, the richness of our research and education at the School of Medicine. Um, I think that's actually a good thing uh, that people can listen to Dr. Cohen give a lecture about vaccines, about testing, about isolation with COVID. So we're about bringing information to the community and making sure that they have all the data and facts. And who exactly is an ideal candidate to participate in, in this mini medical school? 
Well, Scott, you can participate. It's anybody out there, anybody who is has a computer and internet can sign up. Uh, and it's open to really anybody. Um, uh, we could have anybody from across the country sign up. We're just about providing information about what goes on here at UC Davis. And there's other topics other than COVID, things about aging, healthy, healthy aging in a digital world, Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's a myriad of things. You know, we have a lot of experts here at the School of Medicine. Um, we are ranked number seventh in primary care in the country, 40 in research. We are one of the top NIH funded medical schools and this year hit a record of $180 million in one year of NIH funding. And that means our researchers are at the cutting edge of both basic science research, but also clinical research trials that impact patients on a day-to-day -day basis with things like neuroscience and cancer. So I'm so proud that Mini Medical School is really providing a service to the community. Given all of the things you just described that, that uh, the campus and the medical school are involved with and all of those achievements, I'm curious, when participants come in and they go through the, the program, what is it that typically they say, I just had no idea when I stepped into this that UC Davis Medical School was doing all these things? I think that they really have an appreciation for the gem that is UC Davis School of Medicine. I think people who take the mini medical school really have an aha moment that they didn't know that they had this amazing resource in their community. And um, I think it really furthers the relationship of UC Davis School of Medicine and UC Davis with our community. You know, um, COVID has brought science and medicine so much closer to the community. And this is just another way that we are serving the community by broadening everybody's knowledge base about so many things in medicine. How do, how do the classes themselves differ and what it is that the medical students uh, are experiencing as they go through their process with the same instructors? So the classes are set up very similarly. Of course, some of the topics are compressed. Um, and, um, but I think the take home message is that the people who are attending mini, mini medical school are actually getting things that are coming straight out of our classes like Stu Cohen or Charlie DeCarly or a healthy and aging in a digital world. So, so those are all things that are touched base in our classes. Um, you know, our medical students right now, many of them have been virtual, particularly in years one and two. We're looking forward to having them all back on campus, we hope, in the fall. Uh, but, you know, people who are doing medical, mini medical school, it's virtual. So they're not getting too much different than our students are getting right now. Interesting. What does UC Davis itself gain from providing this experience to the community? Well, one of the things that's really important to UC Davis is our relationship with the community. We are here to improve health of the community. And whether that's by educating, providing testing like we're doing it with Healthy Davis Together, um, bringing cutting edge research directly to our patients, um, it's all about a community engagement. So I like to think that we have four missions at the School of Medicine, education, research, clinical care, and providing those all three together as an integrated medical center. But perhaps the fourth is most important. It's the community. Having the community as our partner in everything we do is so vitally important to both us and the community. Hmm. And what aspect of the program tends to be the most popular with the students that come through this program? Well, I think they like to hear about aging. Um, that's always a hot topic. Um, I think that's uh, one of the things that everybody wants to know is what they, what they can do to prevent aging. Um, I also think they wanna know right now about COVID, that's a, a big thing. And also self-care is a bit a hot topic. Um, that sense of well-being. You know, COVID has really put a strain on everyone, healthcare providers, students, uh, members of our community with that isolation. And so I think that was also a very interesting topic. Hmm. I, I hear that you all are planning uh, one of these many medical schools that are focused 
on the Vietnamese population. Can you share with us a little bit about that? Yes, it's in tremendously exciting. Um, some of the classes will be in Vietnamese and some will not. Um, we think it'll have room for over a thousand people. And this is just another way that we wanna reach out to our community and provide them what they need um, about learning, about health. Um, I'm, a, I'm a neurologist and I really believe that when you are proactive about staying healthy, you are gonna be so much better off as you age and go through many life's many changes. And that's what we wanna provide. We wanna give people insights into how they keep them, their family and their community healthy. Hmm. Are there any additional plans to do many medical schools that are focused on other cultural groups or other discrete communities like the Vietnamese population? Well, you know, we have a very diverse student body. And in fact, our student body over the last about 10 years is almost 30% uh, Latinx. Uh, and I would imagine that we will get plans in place to do things similarly to the Vietnamese uh, medical med mini medical school. Um, you know, it's really interesting because I think if we had said, hey, let's pivot and do mini medical school virtually, pre-COVID people would have said, oh no, they want to come and sit in a, in an auditorium, but you know, the success speaks for itself on the number of people. Mini medical school was always sold out for 19 years, sold out at 750, because that's the number of seats in the auditorium. And now we can have up to 3000 people join us. So I think we, you will see a lot more innovation in our mini medical school program. And again, it's really designed to serve the community uh, and that's what we want to do both with that and the pilot program uh, uh, for the Vietnamese focus program. One of the things I, I've heard from your colleagues at the medical school when they've joined us on the program in the past is that the students really like to get out amongst the community. Is there any overlap or, or uh, in encounter in, you know, in the traditional sessions or even in these virtual sessions for the, of the community to uh, interact or meet any of the medical student population? Well, that's a great point. And I'm gonna take that idea back. Right now, the, the um, presentations don't have medical students, but you know we do have a tremendous medical student body who are really committed to the underserved. Over 50% of our students go into primary care and over 60% of our students actually take care of an underserved population. So the commitment to our medical students to really care for um, the next generation, they're, they're committed to keeping Northern California healthy. And almost, I think 96 to 98% of our students stay in California. So we'll see whether or not we can have some of our students participate in one of the future mini medical schools. I'm sure they would absolutely love it. So. Scott, I'll take that idea back. All right. Uh, where, and, where can I and the rest of the public find out more if we're interested in participating? Because I know that we've got to get in there early, given the fact that it's always oversubscribed. Well, you can go to the website and uh, we'll put that below. And then um, uh, you can actually see the, the courses and they'll all be posted online um, once the courses have all been given. And then we do it twice a year. So we'll make sure to uh, give you a heads up when there's the next time to register. Hmm. Uh, turning from the mini medical school, just uh, wanted to go back to COVID-19 again and the pioneering work that the medical school has done uh, on that issue. Right now, we're, we're in a stage where uh, the vaccine distribute or, or production is going up. Distribution is still uh, a bit lacking. Uh, what, what are you all doing now the, at this moment in terms of this continuing rollout and the fact that these variants are popping up? Well, as I mentioned, we've participated in several of the Pfizer vaccine trials and others. Uh, we've actually um, vaccinated over 95% of our medical center population, including all of our residents and our medical students. And we're really, really proud of that. Um, we have set up vaccine clinics and they're um, uh, kind of around key areas. Um, in fact, we 
had a vaccine clinic um, in the mind center and we're looking to move that off site so there's better parking. It is really a supply chain issue. And so we are hoping that there will be more because we are ready to give vaccine when it arrives. We have been notifying our patients, uh, those who are 65 and above, uh, and we're also notifying patients who have uh, multiple other risk factors uh, and bringing and putting them on a list and pushing out invitations through our uh, UC Davis Health app. And uh, for those of us who are a bit confused by all of the information on vaccines, because there are so many different manufacturers uh, and we hear so many different things about this one is 94% accurate, 75% uh, accurate, one dose, two dose. Uh, is there anything in general you can share with us about uh, as we all as individuals move forward to get the vaccine? Um, should we try to be discerning customers and ask for one over the other? or what any advice would be helpful because I think many in the public are a bit confused. So I had a family member ask me that yesterday and here's the answer I gave, get a vaccine. And if it's a two shot, get both shots. If it's a one shot, get the one shot and still wear your mask, still do social distancing and hand hygiene. Um, this idea that you get a vaccine and you don't have to wear a mask is, there's no science behind that. The science is vaccine, wear a mask, socially distance, do hand hygiene, all of those things. Um, there have been reports of people who were vaccinated who still uh, developed the virus. And so it is really a multi-pronged approach. And that's what I highly recommend. We are um, suggesting that all of our uh, faculty, students get tested once a week, whether they've been vaccinated or not. And I just wanna give a wonderful shout out to the UC Davis campus. They stood up testing, asymptomatic testing at Davis and they've been testing the community. They've been testing all of the students there and they set up with cooperation with us, they set up testing in Moore Hall and we're now providing testing um, around multiple sites uh, for asymptomatic testing. So continuing to test, wear a mask, socially distance, hand hygiene, and get a vaccine. When you're offered a vaccine, take it. That's what my recommendation is. Sounds like good advice. I want to go back to uh, something you said a little bit earlier about um, the medical school graduates that come out of your institution. One of the things that uh, has been reported on repeatedly over the past few years is that we're facing a physician shortage as the baby boom generation uh, ret retires out. Uh, do you have any thoughts uh, uh, as the Dean of the Medical School on what we as California should be doing to make sure that we've got the workforce that we need for California's healthcare future? So one of the things medical schools can do to improve health is to train a diverse workforce. For example, the Latinx population in California is about 40%. The number of physicians in California who are identified as Latinx are 4%. So there is excellent data to show that when you have a provider that has a shared cultural background, that people are more likely to go to the doctor, they're more likely to take the advice, and they're more likely to follow that advice long-term. I'm very proud that the School of Medicine has had for the last seven years over 50% women graduate from medicine. Uh, and I'm actually the third woman dean in a row in the School of Medicine. I don't think there's any other school of medicine in the country that can say they've had three women deans uh, in a row and at the leadership of the School of Medicine. So the ways we can change and improve health is to get doctors out in the community one of the things that's really special about our students, and there are many things that are special about our students, is that they oftentimes return to the community where they grew up. And many of our students come from um, underserved areas. And so when we train them to be physicians, whether they are primary care or neurologists like me, if they go back to their community, then they are actually improving health in the community. 
And that means there's more access to care where people live and they don't have to travel so long to come. It's interesting to note, people may not realize that the School of Medicine is one of the only academic medical centers in Northern California. So if you leave Sacramento and you drive north, the next School of Medicine that you hit is in Oregon. So wow. we are really training all those people who come from Northern California to UC Davis, we're training them and we're sending them back into their communities oftentimes where they are providing help. And they're also being role models for the next generation. So that, that child who goes to that primary care physician and looks up and sees someone who looks like them, that means that child may go and see some, they say, you know, I think I could go to medical school because, you know, I want to be like my doctor. And isn't that just heartwarming? Because that's really what it's all about. It's about the next generation. Agreed. I'm curious, you're talking about how much uh, UC Davis is out in the community. How can the community support the, the medical school? Well, um, of course, uh, giving to the medical school is really important. One of the things that is crucial is making sure that people can afford to go to medical school. So scholarships and, you know, you can give a little money. As every bit helps to make sure that the students um, don't have debt. Many, med many doctors graduate from medical school with two, three, four hundred thousand dollars in debt. And oftentimes that means that they have to pick specialties that are um, a little bit more um, uh, higher salary. And, and we wanna make sure that our students can go into the specialties that they want to go into to pursue the career they want to. And one of the ways we can do that is to make sure that they have very little debt. So medical scholars, school scholarships for the School of Medicine students is crucial. Uh, the other thing is we have other programs, like we have a comprehensive cancer center. We have an, a National Institute of Health sponsored Alzheimer's disease center. We have a myriad of programs that people can support. You can support programs in a couple of ways. First of all, you can always give money, but the other way you can do that is you can volunteer to be in a trial. Um, you can be what I call a normal, a normal control in a trial. Um, I've been a normal control in a couple different trials, and that's really wonderful. So we have uh, trials for aging, trials for cancer. We have a ways that people can engage in multiple, multiple ways. So if you have a family history, for example, um, you could be in a research study just because you have a family history, not that you need to have a particular disease to be in a research trial. That's interesting because I, I think that the common assumption is that you, you had to be sick uh, in order to participate in a trial at all. And it sounds like you're saying something different than that. Well, the vaccine trials are a great example. You definitely don't have to be sick to be in those. Um, and sometimes we have trials um, where we're seeking normal controls, for example, healthy aging controls. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we have a new aging clinic here um, that is opening in Midtown where we have comprehensive uh, care for the older adult. And um, that's where you get really care that's focused just on being an older adult. And then if you wanna be in a trial, you can volunteer to be a healthy control, or if you have problems, you can uh, volunteer to be in whatever uh, disease uh, that you may have. But you know, really a school of medicine is here to serve the community and having people participate in research is so crucial. And the outpouring that we had about the vaccine trials was amazing. Scott, we had almost 5,000 people sign up in one week to be in the Pfizer trial. We put 230 patients in that trial and we were one of the most diverse sites that they had. But 5,000 people, that was incredible. And, and what did you learn, you and your colleagues learned from that experience that you didn't even know about your own capability based on that achievement? 
Well, I think we knew that if we push things out um, through programs like yours, that people responded. And we also learned that um, the community was really engaged in really changing the narrative about COVID. And so we wanna take that and change the narrative about Alzheimer's disease, neurologic disease, cancer. Um, you know, we have a, a really a nationally recognized cancer center with nationally recognized clinical trials for patients. Uh, but patients need to come here and seek out those trials and partner with the physician. So when you come here, uh, your physician knows about all those research opportunities and, and can put you in one of those trials. And that's, um, that's oftentimes the way you get the most cutting edge treatments is to be in a research trial. I personally have run over 30 different research trials myself as a neurologist. And I know that when I have patients in research studies, I see them really often. I get to know them very well and um, they get excellent care when they're in a research trial. And many times all participation in those trials is, is covered by the trial. Or, and it, it really is a wonderful way for a patient to give back to the community, but also to get a part of, be part of the, be part of the solution, really. What you know, what you don't know that you don't know. And I think we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you um, for all that you do and uh, for all of your efforts out in the community. Thank you so much, Scott. And that's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org slash video. This Studio Sacramento episode is supported by UC Davis Health, where doctors, nurses, and researchers share a passion for advancing health. Learn more about their latest medical innovations at health.ucdavis.edu.